told my phone no music. <laughs> <laughs> I put in silent. They use the volume. Unless the line the turns it off again. Yeah, that's beyond that's beyond my control. <laughs> At least I'm happy that my phone is visited by divine beings. <laughs> Could be worse. <sighs> but still, I like that message that I got. <laughs> as well, as I just finished finish mentioning the four foundations and the phone says I don't quite get that <laughs> <laughs> and as I was trying to continue it was the break time so. any questions about uh, the Kalamas? Kalamas, yeah now <clears throat> Kalamas, as I said, were a group of intellectuals. They liked the Buddha's criteria. Even to this day, especially in the West, Kalama discourse is used as a um, as criteria of um, approach, actually. In the scriptural, because in when you use the scriptural approach, you need to have yourself educated in the criteria. So, uh, but it doesn't block you, prevent you from being devotional, it's no problem. Because devotion that comes from confidence. Remember when we explain devotion, sadha, S A D D H A sadha two two kinds so that uh, uh, groundless or near devotional faith, of course devotion and faith are synonymous. But uh, the better translation of the Buddhist Kali term devotion is confidence. Sadha, that's the literal translation. It comes Sadha. I think I don't need to get them on the word, right? The last time you wrote them down, Sadha, S A D D H A Sadha. That is confidence. So confidence, you build the confidence of upon teaching by by investigating, by examining his teachings. You don't simply embrace it out of blind faith. If you do, then that would be um, groundless faith. You, you may lose that devotion anytime. Right? Um, for example, I knew one of my friends, he was very devotional in, in Buddhism, in temple, in me as well. Somehow it was my mistake before I flew overseas. I asked someone to mail his tax receipt so that he missed the tax uh, deadline. Right? So as a result, he was very angry with me. I apologized to him like maybe multiple times. But uh, somehow it took him like another couple of years to come back to me. So, so it happens. It was my mistake anyway. I. I, I, I will mail it myself, but I, I was so busy that I had one of my friends and he got busy too, he forgot. <laughs> he forgot to mail it. So he didn't get that uh, before February, sorry, April, April 15th. Mm, deadline. So, but I'm not using it as, a, as an example for blind uh, faith, but actually, uh, he was right, I was wrong, but, uh, so that uh, later he came back to me and said, late I felt ashamed because, as you said, I had the best knowledge of Pali and scriptures in your class, but I am the one to break, um, break up with you. Nobody else did. What happened to my knowledge? I said, nothing happened to your knowledge. Probably that's a temporary breakdown. You broke up because I'm responsible for that. Again, I I put the blame on myself. Uh, I kept saying that until he blocked me. If you ever say that, put the blame on yourself. I'm going to walk away. Uh, well, I will break up this time because you put the blame on yourself. That's how we came back to me. So. Uh, yeah, sometimes I think a relevant example is like, okay, 
thì uh, let's see uh, so you like the particular monk because he he's a slow walker and he's very calm and quiet he hardly speak right? all of a sudden you see him angry and yelling at someone else and that would shock you and then you turn back and go home and for the next few weeks you will come back to come to see him I may want to see him why? because it was anti-climax kind of so it was uh, against uh, the image of him that you, image of him that you have so permanent so you have lost your devotion but what if you have rational uh, reason faith, not blind faith, and you you should do wait it and until you get his attention and probably he would feel ashamed, probably would he would calm down and then you would approach him saying, I know you are a human being, you might get angry too. Sorry to see that, but anyway I think can I do anything to help you out? Probably you miss an ample chance to teach him a lesson as a lay person. So, uh, uh, so that is, if you if you can you couldn't have taken a role, a central role in approaching him and telling him that people if anything happened, if they are that I can help you or something. Probably that could have been a big lesson for him in the way that he would never ever get angry. So if you have a recent faith in him, that you should have done. But you simply had uh, some irrational faith, uh, not recent faith. Maybe blind faith or maybe not really blind but uh, uh, groundless faith. That's why you just turned back and went away. And so that you were sad that you had followed the wrong guy. Why? In your perception, the monkey is not supposed to get angry. What if you believe right at the beginning of your okay, he is a monk but he is human too and he is friend. Not posting, I always tell my friends, always okay. Don't consider me a monk and be friendly and we are parallel, we can sit together and talk together because I learn a lot from you. At that that point I never get tired. Tired of what? Tired of maintaining the position. Is the guy the he personality view? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. uh, so, that's what Buddha wanted because after his being in mind, he didn't have to think about his position. Whereas we do. But if you let go of your ego and then prepare yourself, uh, to for open up for criticisms, even negative ones, this not not simply constructive, even destructive criticisms. And when you are ready to face the worst, actually you are ready to have more peace. That's when you put yourself at peace, because right from the beginning you are ready to face any any uh, negative. It could be the worst criticism. It could be the worst. Uh, now it may I know like, but still, uh, you won't lose your peace. Why? That's what you expect. When you expect that. So, and that's that's the problem of perception, as what he says. Our perception is such that we want everyone to embrace us, come to us, and the world has to be a good place. And then you, we perceive. In our perception, we maintain that uh, the friend that I just made, just met, would be my best friend. How many times you met your best friend? That's about pressure. <laughs> yeah. So that's 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 the perception. So we have talked about so much at this point, just to just to get the point that uh, uh, when it comes to truth. So that is the perceived truth and the actual truth. So Buddha talks about two levels of truth in his teachings. Now all his teachings are divided into, uh, put in two categories. Mm. By the way, 
two levels of truth. These are the scriptural terms of truth. Where you are familiar with the two levels of truth, the two universal terms that we use to explain the two levels of the conventional truth and the absolute ultimate truth. Ultimate to absolute truth and uh, conventional truth. Now, now Buddha is enlightened for the reason that he is enlightened is Buddha. It's wrong to say Buddha is enlightened. Uh, so, now, did I mention uh, the mountain, no mountain metaphor the last time? No, right? Okay, so this is an analogy. Now, Buddha and I go to the Himalayas, if in India or the Rocky Mountains, and we Rocky Mountains on the Canada side many times, from Calgary, it's hour and a half, right? Now, in North of Colorado, let's say, Buddha and I go to the Rocky Mountains, or maybe the Himalayas, let's say. People are, or the Fuji Mountain in Japan. Those are formidable spiritual places, sacred. So, we go to the Himalayas, let's say we fly, fly to Nepal, Bokhara, and then we, now Buddha and I are now standing against the formidable uh, the Himalayas. Right? And then, so that uh, now Buddha and I, in Buddha's in Buddha's view, not perception. I would like to say the word view, but Buddha doesn't have perceptions. The perception is something that we make. So Buddha sees the truth as it is. Now and then now I am talking to Buddha now. So oh, Buddha, my Lord, sir, see this is the first time I am I am seeing the Himalayas. Is so spiritual and so formidable. If I don't know how to get there, but if I can, I would. And then, then I would ask him a question. How do you see it? And he would explain. Uh, then I would say, it looks so spiritual, so formidable. It's like divine to me. I wonder whether it's a real mountain or is it is a surreal. And then I would say. And the Buddha would turn to me and say, yes, Sukhananda, it is real. Uh, but at the same time, then I, wait a minute, sir. You said in your sermons yesterday, there's no Himalaya, there's no mountain, because nothing really does exist. But today, you just told me that the mountain is there. Yes, it is there. Then why did you say that there's no mountain? Given your sermon on emptiness, there cannot be Himalayas. And then Buddha says to me, okay, you can add more, say there's no Upananda watching the mountain, there's no we Buddha watching the mountain, looking at the mountain, there's nothing then. Yeah, but, okay, and I said, yeah, but, and he said to me, yeah, but, then what? Then you accept there's the mountain, right? You see the mountain. Yes. Then why did you say that in my, in terms of, in light of my sermon yesterday, that, uh, that there cannot be the Himalayas? So, it's a struggle. I have to struggle. I have to struggle uh, to believe that the mountain is real. At the same time, I have to struggle to see whether the mountain is not real. And uh, in good faith, in the Buddha's teaching that he gave me yesterday, now I'm having it besides me, and then I'm trying, I'm struggling to convince me what it has no Himalaya. There's no Himalayas here. But the struggle is within me. Buddha has no struggle. The point here is, the point here that I'm trying to make is, by, uh, by saying yes to my question whether the Himalayas actually does exist, uh, did he lie? Did Buddha lie by saying yes to my question whether the mountain is, mountain Himalayas does really exist. Did he lie? No, he would never. Yeah, never. 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 But, and at the same time, he said that there's no Himalaya. Did he lie at that point? No. no. Then why he has to, why he said yes and no to the same question? Because, 
Himalayas does exist. Himalayas doesn't exist. So, at the on the absolute level of truth, there's no Himalayas. The Himalayas mountain that does exist. And on the conventional level of truth, yes, the Himalaya does exist. But then, so what is missing here? That is our perception. Because physically, mountain is up there. It, it is substantial. It has substance. It is real. It is tangible. You can go there and touch. Get there and touch. It is there. But what if you deconstruct philosophically or... Uh, so you deconstruct the mountain, uh, Himalayas, and you analyze, you reduce the atomic level, and then subatomic particles, everything. In the ultimate analysis of the matter that has created the Himalayas, there's nothing left. It happens to you because they say when you get probably in this uh, missile, this temple is tends to be a very rural. Almost the entire state used to be rural, but as in many decades ago they start the state started putting up uh, in new uh, highways, uh, freeways, toll roads, everything, and then. They are all hill, hills, mountains, they disappeared. Right? And so the mountains were there. What about if you ask your grandpa, your grandparents, or someone who still remember the history? And they would say, okay, the kind of St. Louis that I knew is nowhere. It's a new St. Louis here. And even if I explain to you what, what St. Louis would look like back in few decades and you wouldn't be able to know what it is. So so are you saying that there's no San Lu wow, this is San Lupis, but this is not the kind of San Lupis that I saw. So you don't like no I don't like this the, the way the San Lupis is right now. <coughs> so what happens to his perception now? He has new perception now. He's forced he's emotionally forced to believe in that there's a new San Luis here, but he had difficulty accepting that. Why? Because he was not, he was impressed with the different San Luis that he saw decades ago. It makes me think of, like in the Lanka, the Fire Sutra, mm -hmm. it talks about how everything's mind made, and that if you would never project anything to begin with, you mm -hmm. wouldn't have to see anything as empty. Exactly, right. It's how everything is projected. Mm -hmm. That's true. Is uh, perception is projection. So it's like we don't even have to see anything is empty if we don't if think we about it. Yeah. <laughs> because all of these problems are because we struggle to see. It's all mind made, like the first line of the Dhamma Pada too, right? Yeah, mind made the forerunner. Mind mm -hmm. forerunner. Yeah. Mind by mind, made by mind. Made by mind. So that's, that's, uh, so then, and then so the two levels of truth, and then to, to me, uh, that Zen statement comes from that story. I say, mountain, no mountain, mountain. Uh, when I am standing against the mountain, there is mountain, so it is a mountain to me. And then now then I look at the mountain in light of what Buddha has taught me, there is no mountain. And then I take a deep breath and I need to get home and it's night, it's late. I am back into my conventional life and then I would take a last look at the mountain and say, the mountain, yes. In the mid middle intermediate state was no mountain. So that's what the saying goes like mountain, no mountain, mountain. So we believe in the mountain. That is our conventional truth, conventionally. And then in, in a doctrinal analysis like this, mountain actually disappears, it makes sense, right? Okay, well, atomically, when you deconstruct the mountain into the atomic and subatomic levels and there's nothing quantum, nothing left, that's, so there's no way that I see Himalayas right now. How could I see the Himalayas? Because there's no one understanding here. There, there are no eyes to think. That's why I get the Zen part, right? Not thinking about you. Actually, we're thinking about this. That's why he sent the card. Why did he spend money on the card and the stamp? Just to say 
you're not thinking about you. So he's, he's spending money over the car and walking to the post office and putting a stamp on it and the mail putting in the box and probably talking to the desk uh, asking for how much it would be the, for the postage given the way, right? All that uh, uh, sacrifice was that he believed that he, he does exit and he has a friend. But, but the car he bought was not thinking about you. That is his philosophical. It is non, nothingness type of uh, perception. So, and then, uh, and Buddha says, now, there's no other way that, now this is Buddha's own statement, there's no other way to offend the Buddha than when you misinterpret a nayatta, a nayatta teaching as a nitatta and the nitatta teaching as a nayatta. So nayatta means, uh, that's why when I was writing on the board, I smiled myself because, because of two Y's. N-E-Y-Y-A, T-T-A, right? I, I love to play with words. Y-Y, mm -hmm. A, Y, Y, in Singlish go A, Y. You are asking you why. Atta means meaning. What is the meaning? So, Nayyatta means, Nayya means, Atta means meaning here. Meaning, that is, yet to be inferred, yet to be uh, concluded. That is Nayyatta. Now, Nayyatta means, teachings that are yet to be interpreted. That are? Teaching that? That are yet, teaching that is, the, yeah, the teaching that is yet to be interpreted, yet to be inferred, yet to be analyzed. That's called Nayyatta. Nayya means interpretable, yet to be interpreted, yet to be translated, to be defined. Nayyatta. So, uh, and that type of teaching corresponds to conventional truth. Teaching that requires further analysis, further interpretation. Nayyatta. Atta means meaning. A T T A Atta. Sorry, I think I misspelled that. There should be one more T. Sorry about that. It has to be H. Otherwise, it is soul. Atman. Nita, Nayyatta, Atta. Atta is meaning. Nita means, Nayya is to be interpreted, to be defined, uh, to be provided with commentary. So that uh, those who don't understand could understand all it is easily. Nita means the opposite of Nayya. Nita means already interpreted already interpreted, already defined sutras. That type of discourses correspond to absolute truth. Yes? So the niyata is to be, and then one above it is not yet to be. Not yet, yeah. So to be it's is yet to be, yeah. to be. <laughs> yet, to be. <laughs> yet to be, and already? To uh, be or not no. to be. <laughs> so, yeah. The, the third one is, not to be interpreted anymore. Yes, yet to be and not to be. I, I like that way. Yeah, that's true. That I don't remember that here. I mean, I mentioned that. Not to be, yet to be, and not to be. That's the question. Right. <laughs> that's the question, yeah. So, teachings that are yet to be defined or translated, that corresponds to teachings of the conventional truth. For example, the Himalayas or the mountain. Why a sermon, if the Buddha gives a sermon on the Himalayas or the Everest or the Rocky Mountain? And it needs further clarification. Why? Because Buddha talks about, Buddha did talk, just talked about the Rocky Mountains. 
And then I wonder why he said that, because he said there's no team on the next thing he said, according to this. And why did he say that? So that, uh, so the mountain needs more clarification. It, it needs to be interpreted again. Why? Because Buddha said the mountain is there. And isn't that against his own teaching that there's no mountain? So I question. So that's why it needs further clarification. Because the first type of teaching is, actually that's when some people, a lot of people, then Buddha said there's no other way to offend, offend him. Simply because, you know, sometimes it happens uh, day by day. Recently also I heard some stories that some people who vandalize temples and Buddha statues and all that. And so that is, so that on the popular level, people get offended when they see their, uh, how to say, that temples or churches get vandalized. It's offensive to God and Jesus and Buddha, whosoever. But at the same time, but there's a, another real way of offending the Buddha. Why? When you misinterpret his teachings. And that's why I say that people can, those who misinterpret a neyatta one as a nitatta and a nitatta one as a neyatta do offend the Buddha, do misinterpret the Buddha. That's the way to misinterpret. And then also you can ask a very question too. And then recently someone asked me, and I, I talked about uh, karma. And then he, and he referred to a canonical phrase and even showed that to me on his phone after he came ready. And Buddha says, and uh, he said, okay, karma sakarko nati. There is no doer of karma. Vipakasa. So there's no one who would uh, go through the karmic repercussions. Why? There's no one who committed the karma. Because there's no one, there's no karma being committed. So there's no way that for the karma to return. Because there's no one for the karma to return to. And there's no karma for itself to start returning to the very person who did. But that's that statement you come from. And uh, so it comes from uh, Nitatta. Say, you cannot put a Nitatta back in Neyatta. But you can reinterpret the Neyatta and you can add it to the second category. Because you say, there is no dual karma. There is no one who would go through the faith, the karmic repercussions, the repercussions of his bad karma. And that statement comes in this this type of sutras, nitatta. And so that you can explain, further analyze, interpret the first category and then you can add it to the second one. But you cannot uh, uh, interpret it back so that it, you can put it back in here. Um, so so these are used, this is the first level. And then that's what that was his question, and I told him, "Well, my friend, now you are talking about uh, an explanation that Buddha has given uh, by in correspondence to by by corresponding to his uh, absolute higher level of truth. And on the conventional level, we all live. I am here. I make karma. I commit karma. I go through different life forms." Karma will affect me and will come back to me someday. So then he asked me, then why did he say that there's no dual karma? I said that is that is how uh, enlightened people see the world. Because I see myself, I see everything uh, in terms of uh, how to say uh, value attribute. We are always in the business of value attribution. That's, that's the process. Value attribution. We have to put uh, a certain degree of value to things on a daily basis. That's why uh, something becomes more or less valuable to us. Someone or something becomes more or less valuable to us based on our based on our urge, need. Sometimes my urge, my need, my want in me subconscious. I didn't know why I asked someone for something. At the time, but probably it was in my inner mind. So always, in 
in general, we turn to something or someone be out of uh, need. We don't have <coughs> urge. The need is so deep, profound, and it is an urge. So uh, and so it's so that's why we we see the same objects from different angles because we, that's our conventional approach. Again, conventional conventional approach is always subjective. Now, when Buddha and I went to the Himalayas, uh, while he had the objective, objective approach to the Himalayas, just to, and he reduced himself to my level, to have a dialogue with me, in which he said, well, uh, he, he showed me that he is subjective. Yes, Dukhananda, you see the mountain as true. But actually, in his inline mind, uh, he's fixed. Now his built-in approach is subjective. My built-in approach is uh, his built-in approach is objective. My built-in approach is subjective. Because I always say, I am seeing the mountain. Before I mention the mountain, I mention I, myself. People say, I am hungry. That's why when you go to high level of Vipassana, sometimes your teacher would ask you to, they, they would uh, prescribe you a certain uh, phrase that you would utter in your head, uh, say in your head, for example, okay. Uh, there is anger, there is tiredness, there is lethargy, and then that lethargy is me, that anger is me. But conventionally we find it difficult, it's crazy to say that. Right? So, you automatically, quite naturally we say, I am angry. What if you, because the addict to, the addict to angry describes myself so I am angry, meaning angry. Angry as a, an adjective explain I, which is a noun. What if you remove that and use the objective approach and say, uh, not that I am angry, there is anger. And that anger is me. That is called the objective approach. That is why in Buddhist uh, Abhidharma, Buddhist psychology, always the self would be deconstructed into different areas. For example, in Satipatthana, four foundations of mindfulness, two, the body, the sensation of feeling, the mind, sensations of feelings, and the whatever and the whatever we grasp, dharmas. Dharma includes the ex external world as well. And then, so instead of saying, talking about defining the personhood, and would uh, be divides into uh, five aggregates. Always there's this deconstruction. Uh, in uh, in day to day life, we would be able to use those terms. Those are not that terms that correspond to the absolute truth. And then. Uh, those, if you use these terms in regular people might find you crazy, you, you are insane. But it's always in your, uh, in your head that you could use. But actually, I, I test them in silence. And then, uh, for example, when my teacher taught me about uh, uh, those objective phrases, subjective phrases, actually uh, the correct term is, uh, Statements of subjectivity. Statements of objectivity. So that's when he had a story that he would had uh, amla fruit, the transparent, bittersweet fruit from India. So Nelly, N E L L I, Nelly or amla, A M L A amla. So it's transparent. It's bitter when you take a bite. It's real bitter, but when you uh, so that uh, when you breathe it from your mouth or you drink some water, it gives you a sweet aftertaste. The instant, instantaneously it is bitter, but the aftertaste remains much longer, sweet. And Buddha showed that too. So just 
like you can see through this fruit, see through yourself, try to be objective, as objective as possible. Because as long as you remain subjective, you will be able to address the perennial problem of insecurity, the suffering that you go through. You always start from yourself. Instead of realizing the truth, you end up in further justification. Subjective approach leads to justi justification. Whereas objective approach helps us to see the truth behind whatever whatever object that we see. And then again, what is the what is the truth that Buddha talks about? Everything has conventional conventional everything has a substance. Everything has a value. But when you Define that. When you keep reducing that, if it's a material object, it could be a phenomena, it could be a perception, it could be a concept, and then finally, there will be nothing left. Finally, the only thing is, only thing left is uh, nothingness. So, truth in Buddhism is not one word; it's a whole process. There's no single word called truth. There's nothing a single reality that is called truth. It's always a whole process. So it's like depending on the person asking the question, the mm. description of what truth is will yeah. vary. That yeah. would still be truth, but it's more like a deconstruction of right. a question. Of a question, right? That you then say is truth. Truth, yeah, that's true. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's when but when Buddha was asked what Satya was. And his mind, at times he didn't answer at all. He was silent. At times he would give a long description uh, to the extent that the listener would get fed up with his explanation. And the Buddha would smile and stop and say, I am I am I'm fed up, I am tired, but you are smiling. Because if I, uh, if I never explain this part, and you would have gotten more frustrated. That's why I didn't explain. Because you demanded an explanation. That's what I did. So, and so that's at, but at, at certain times, and would, would abruptly end this uh, discussion and close his eyes and smile, and to the uh, thereby shocking the person. Sometimes and he didn't answer. Right? He didn't answer at all. Yeah. It's called the tapani. Yeah, that's another term. Tapaniya means not to be answered. Uh, he, uh, certain, certain metaphysical questions. And then about karma, about the universe. Uh, self is not Not the yeah, self, self, non self. And so, so, sometimes some people, yeah, that's another term that corresponds to absolute truth and uh, conventional truth. Uh, I didn't give you the Pali terms, corresponding Pali terms. So, uh, absolute truth, no way, I didn't mention that. Samuti. Samuti. Uh, Paramat. S A M M U T I. P A R A M A. Tha Paramatta. Paramatta. Parama means absolute. Atta means meaning. Absolute truth. Samuti and Paramatta. Uh, so when you read MMK, Mulamanta Mirakarika, back to MMK, that uh, the, page, the book with thousands of pages. Right? So that when will Nagarjuna and he goes back and forth. Uh, he comes back to one single phrase. Uh, so the theme of that big book is everything does exist, nothing does exist. Everything does exist, nothing does exist. What he means by that phrase is the same thing. And there, uh, in order for conventional understanding, he mentions samsara and nirvana. Samsara is uh, uh, no, samsara is nirvana, kinchita, vishesana. 
when you compare samsara with nirvana, nirvana is no different than samsara. No, samsara, no, nirvana is samsara in this activities. No, when you compare nirvana with samsara, again, there's no difference. So did you, did you get that point? But again, he keep explaining throughout the, the, the big book. And then, uh, so that, when you read, let's say, 500, okay, 250th verse, and it corresponds to the very first one. And let's say, I, I forgot how many verses there, a few, few hundreds. Let's say, let's say it has uh, 500 verses. And then each verse, sloka, uh, every sloka corresponds to everyone, everyone else. Because each verse talks about the same thing. Let's say one verse explains what samsara is, the next one explains what nirvana is. But the one that explains nirvana at the same time explains samsara. And the one that explains sams nirvana explains samsara at the same time. So you can't find, draw a line between neyakta and nita. You can draw a line between samuti and paramatta, conventional and absolute. Why? Because there's no landscape, for example. Let's say, uh, okay, this is the landscape of Parma, absolute. There, this is now <coughs> within within the Himalayas. You see both truths based on who is looking at. When Buddha is looking at the Himalayas, there's no Himalaya. At the same time, if I add, when in case quite spontaneously, when I say, ah, oh, this is formidable, beautiful Himalayas. And then, and Buddha whispers to me, no Himalayas. Sorry sir, did you say no Himalayas? Uh, yes, I did. But the moment if you, you agree to come with me to see the Himalayas, you should do, so that, why did you then say that there's no Himalayas at that time? No, you are right there, the Himalayas is there. That's what you are seeing. But you just told me that there's no Himalaya. And then he would simply smile. Why? He never wanted to give further clarification that would uh, make me offend, uh, feel offended. And he would simply, okay, you go and try and do your own investigation, go meditate. And the wordings can't help you anymore. Statements can't help you anymore. Well, does anyone want to ask a question or not? What are the name of the, those categories again? The, the bottom ones are the two levels of truth. Oh, yeah. Um, the top two yeah. terms are called ones. Oh, you mean the one on top? Yeah. This one? Yeah. Yeah, some of the. Is it, if it's okay, I use some of these. Yeah. Hmm. Could you tell me? Because it's. Which one? The one about the TV? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think we're going to have to get lights up here before the winter. Okay, much better. Yeah, thank you. Is that one okay? Yeah. Okay. 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 Are those normally two truths? What category are those two terms? So, and how do they differ from the Sam other? Samuti is conventional, and Paramatta is absolute or ultimate. So the, the, two, the two levels? I hear. Actually, these two levels of truth, that's this one. Oh, yeah. So what are the other two then? These two, these are the scripture, two kinds of uh, teachings. So this one, Nayyata, that needs to be further interpreted. Oh. So it is conventional. And the Nikata, uh, kind of teaching that uh, needs no further uh, interpretation. So they are Nikatas. Meaning is already drawn out. That's nitatta. Nayyatta meaning is yet to be drawn out. So yet to be interpreted. Does yeah. the absolute ultimate truth is that the same? That doesn't yeah. need to be drawn out anymore? Yeah, that's right, yeah. This one. That's when people, that's why one of my friends who came to me and say, okay, in your teaching you said uh, when we commit karma, make karma and karma will return to me. But I came up with this teaching, there's no dual karma. So there cannot be any karma. There's no returning of karma. Then I told him, okay, that is an explanation that falls within the Nithattas. You can put it back and 
and say it's okay to then why not I said if you then if, if, if you stop stop believing in uh, no karma no dual karma no return no karma you could very very easily become a non-actionist non-actionist like non-actionist and you could you wouldn't really have any regard for morality ethics and you could kill anyone there's no moral response there's no ego so that uh, that's when so the need of the discourses are not supposed to be considered conventional two levels but always the you would say uh, first study the naya actors and then don't rush to mm, understand realize don't try to struggle to understand the second level need actors why? You would end up misinterpreting the Buddha's teaching. And you would go to the extent and say, there is no Buddha. What some, sometimes happens with people with the concept of emptiness, mm -hmm. and they misunderstand, and That's they right, go to yeah. that extreme of... Yeah. Actually, one girl uh, last time in uh, Chiswick, London, and uh, she had attended lots of classes, and. And she, her, she had personal time and she came and she, you know, one day I try my best to uh, have my, try to use my no self. But I'm angry yesterday also I called with my mom. Where is my no self? I said, okay, then it took me like two hours and a half to explain that to her. And she talked lots of norms. And then I told her, well, now, when you go back home tonight, and her mom is very happy, and I know the person. And then, uh, so that uh, poor girl. So, and then uh, I know that. But still, uh, well, uh, there's no point putting the blame on your mom. You can change her. You can change yourself. If you change yourself, the more you change yourself, you, are, you get closer to no-self. So is that possible? That means I don't already have a no-self? I say you do, but you don't see it. Why? Because it is covered with self.